finally, you know, went up to see Lakshmi and we uh, well, got into lines and then we were broken up into gendered lines, right? There was one line for women and one line for men because God hates fun. So, <laughs> one of our naughty bits touched while we were waiting in line. <laughs> left them by the door if we could have, you know? <laughs> kind of a design flaw if you ask me, right? <laughs> the real reason why they do it is to uh, prevent like inappropriate touching, groping, sexual assault, that sort of stuff. Which is a bizarre thought to me, isn't it? Isn't that a bizarre thought? I don't know anybody that's getting hot and bothered by divinity, right? <laughs> I don't know anybody that's waiting in these lines going, I can't finish unless I know there's omnipotence! <laughs> I don't think we're ever going to finish. <laughs> now, I'm watching this priest very carefully. You know, it's the middle of the day, right? And the people that are at the temple right now are not rich people. They are working class people, right? Average working class people, low to middle income people that spent their hard earned money to be there. You know, they had to spend their hard earned money on the darshan plate. And in order to be there, they either had to take a half day from work or a full day from work, right? So I'm watching what this priest is doing. What he does is he, they, you know, they, the people give him the darshan plate and he does a little mantra. He throws the flower over the deity. He blesses the food. The food goes back to the people. And then there's a donation box, right? And you have to put money into the donation box, right? But you, you don't have to put money into the donation box, but you have to put money into the donation box. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and that's what they do, right? And the second, the second that their fingers leave that bill, the priest is like, all right, fucking next. <laughs> what kind of fast food darshan is this shit? <laughs> what is this, like the KFC of Hinduism? What the fuck? <laughs> So I'm waiting in line, right? And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna get the financial transaction of this interaction done first, you know? Because I'm trying to have a spiritual experience. I'm trying to be more open-minded for my wife. It's been seven years since I've been here, right? I, I, wanna, I wanna try to see if something happens, right? You know, I, I'm trying to be good, so I wanted to get the business end out of it first so then I can have my time with the Lord, right? So I walk up and I put the money into the donation till first. Big mistake because the second that my fingers left that bill, the priest was like, all right, move along, move along, move along, you gotta go, you gotta go, you gotta go. It's like, bro, who is here right now? Right? No one fucking behind me, you know, this is ridiculous. Let me, let me have a couple minutes with the Lord, right? Let me make eye contact with the Lord. Maybe she'll wink at me. This will be a completely different show. <laughs> Just be up here going, guys, I gotta tell you about the word of the Lord. <laughs> It is sponsored by Colgate. <laughs> Let me talk to her for a few minutes, right? Let me look at her and be like, hey, how's it going? I know we've always kind of had a difficult relationship, you know, with the whole, like, I don't think you're real kind of a thing. But I feel like a lot of that is on you. <laughs> for providing, like, no evidence. So, I feel like I'm giving a lot, not getting anything in return. <laughs> So how are you? <laughs> hey, let me ask you a question. Uh, if you're the goddess of wealth and you have like all of the wealth in the whole universe, how come you don't help out poor people? And then I would get kicked out of India. So. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the program. Doing a Thursday live stream today. Usually I do Monday to Wednesday, but we're doing a Thursday one because I uh, had kind of a shitty day yesterday. Uh, burnt myself out uh, with a whole bunch of stress. Uh, so that was fun. <laughs> uh, hope you guys are doing well out there. Uh, we're we're going to be kicking things off in, in just a minute and diving into our, our big stories for the day. Uh, if you guys are tuning in, checking things out, please make sure you hit the share button and uh, feel free to leave some comments. Uh, and you guys know the drill when we do these things is, uh, you know, leave a comment and I will I will read them at the end of each segment uh, so I don't get lost in meandery and all that kind of stuff. Um you know, to give you guys a quick update on what's going on on w with me is still dealing with the car shit. There's there and and it's it's the stress mounts every day that there is no movement in anything. Um, I haven't heard back from the credit union. A bunch of other banks that I'm talking to want me to jump through eighteen thousand different hoops before they'll even like let me apply. Uh, you know, and so it's been, um, really challenging to keep my patience, which is wearing thin with this situation. Uh, honestly, like I would feel, uh, uh, 250,000 times better if, if, if the credit union that I applied to refinance my loan would just fucking call me back. That's all I want. That would be great. I feel like that's not asking a lot. Um, you know, if they, if they say no, then I have to look elsewhere. I, I just want to know an answer. You know what I mean? That's all I fucking want. And yesterday, you know, the reason I kind of tapped out was I had a very frustrating call with that credit union, um, which I think it's like a Legion credit union or something of like that. It's, it's a Pittsburgh based credit union and you just have to live or work within like Allegheny County. It's one of the few that's in town that I don't have to be like employed with a particular company or, you know, work within a union in order to be a member of their bank or even for them to consider to help me apply for a loan. Now, part of the reason why I think uh, it's taking so long is one, possibly a lot of other people are refinancing with them, you know, because I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only one that's been fucked over by a large corporate financial institution. I think part of the other reason is I'm not a member yet. They, every time I talk to somebody, they're like, what about becoming a member? Do you want to become a member? Let's make you a member. And I'm like, no, I need to know whether you guys are going to like accept my loan before I make that kind of commitment. So let's get that answer first. And I think that might be part of the delay in the process. But, you know, it's a double edged sword because I would be I'm, I'm glad to become a member if you guys will accept my fucking application. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I, I was supposed to, I called the loan department and they were supposed to call me back and they did. And I was like away from my phone for like a minute and I came back. So I was on hold for like a half hour and it was just like some generic customer service person called me. And I was like, aren't I supposed to talk to the loan department? And they go, oh, yeah, let me see if I can get a hold of them. And then they come back after 10 minutes and they're like, yeah, no one's available in the loan department. So I can't really forward your call, but I can mark your message as urgent and forward that over to them. And they'll call you within a day or two. And again, you know, today I got no calls. Uh, I got a response from somebody within Citizens One that's like trying to fucking help me sort sort this out and at least get the repo off of my uh, credit history and, uh, you know, that process is currently at a standstill because the point of contact has not gotten back to him because the point of contact is the person that made this agreement with me. And, uh, I still haven't received my detailed financial statements that, that she was supposed to send me go figure. Right. They like, they don't fucking send me any of that shit. Uh, I haven't, you know, the only thing I've received is that letter I showed you guys uh, or not. I don't I don't think I showed you guys yet, but it's basically a letter that says, hey, this is an attempt to collect your debt. Uh, you have overdue payments. This is an, and it was sent. It was mailed out the day after they repoed my car and reached me a week and a half later. So, you know, it's like they didn't try at all. 
They're just trying to cover their asses and be like, see, we melt something. We melt something. Something was there. And it's like, yeah, but after the fact. So after the fact that you illegally repossessed my car with no warning, um, you didn't give me an opportunity to pay back the, you know, the back claims based on the fact that I had lost most of my income due to COVID. Uh, so, yeah, all of that has, you know, it's just this perpetual thing that lingers in the back of my mind. And I'm waiting for the phone call to come through. I'm waiting for messages to come come through so like every time my phone buzzes i'm like ah is this is this a good news is this thing is this something is it gonna be you know and i tripped out yesterday i got through what i needed to get through but by the time it came closer to the stream i was like i i just felt so lousy and like i i wasn't really like concentrating very well and i knew that if i did a stream it would be uh very half-assed uh, and, and, uh, you know, distracted and not focused on what I would like to talk about. So I decided to push it to today. You know, I had all the research and stuff done, so I was able to get ahead on my work and actually concentrate a little bit more today. Um, but I just needed to decompress yesterday. Uh, so, um, and yeah, as, as Aiden says, Aiden says whole ass or no ass. And that's, that's pretty much how, that's pretty much how I look at these streams. I'm not going to half-ass this shit. You know, I don't I don't want to give you guys a poor program. So, um, especially when we're going to be talking about some pretty big and important, um, big and important topics. I don't want to, I don't, I, I want to give these topics, you know, the, the credit they're due. So, uh, let's, uh, let's dive into it. So, this is an article from Sheer Post. Uh, and I found it really, really interesting. I have a lot of friends who are uh, either currently serving in some form for, form of armed services uh, or have served in some form of armed services. So I thought this article, which, which says the military wasn't a way out of poverty for me, uh, written by a gentleman by the name of TJ Thompson, was really, really interesting. And it points out something that I don't think we talk about a whole lot. Uh, and, you know, part of the part of the thing I've talked to a lot of veterans that have come to my show and as vehemently anti-war as I am, I'm not anti-veteran. That's that, that is a misnomer uh, that is that is constantly levied against anti-war people. That if you are anti-war, then you are also immediately anti-veteran. In fact, if you're anti-war, you're probably the most pro-veteran because you don't want to see any more fucking veterans. You, you, we just don't. I do. I don't want to. I don't want to make more vets. I don't want to make more veterans. And maybe if we stop doing that, maybe if we stop doing this shit, we can start focusing on the veterans that already exist and trying to get them services that they need uh, to, you know, improve their lives. Considering they were working class people that went and fought rich people's wars. That's basically what it is. That's the truth of the United States military. It's a bunch of rich people sending poor people out to die for a bunch of resources they want to steal from other countries. There's no other real way to put it. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry I can't sugarcoat that for your, your fervent nationalism, but that's just the way that it is. Uh, so, you know, I, I, so I figured let's let's read this article and uh, and and kind of to talk about some of the stuff that that uh, that he addresses here. So let's start with this. So it says it starts with I grew up in at, on the edge of the Great Dismal Swamp in southern Virginia. We lived in a sewage sewage ravaged bug infested trailer park. I didn't realize we were poor at first. I just thought this is how things were. Which, by the way, is I think a, how a lot of kids in poverty look at it. They don't know that there is something different out there. Um, I know for uh, me growing up, you know, like the fact that I didn't grow up super poor, but I grew up like low to middle class. You know, um, we didn't have like the state of the art technology or any of that sort of stuff. Like we had uh, we had a VHS player when the dvd player was coming out like all my friends had a dvd player and then my dad bought like a vhs dvd combo and shortly after that blu-ray started coming out and he wanted nothing to do with that so it's like you know you know what i mean like we didn't we didn't i didn't grow up in the lag lap of luxury but when i was growing up i just figured hey this is just how fucking things are just like he points out here but it was a difficult place to grow up 
And as I got older, I wanted to escape it. So I took what I thought was my only chance to get out of poverty. I joined the military. So this is, again, and, and then he goes on to say, now I know why they say poverty is a backdoor draft. Um, this is something I've heard a lot. Uh, one of the times I was in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, which is, a, which is you know, has, has a naval yard and a lot of military veterans. Um, I talked to one of them and, you know, he was he was he was a bartender at the bar. I think he was he might have also been the co-owner of the place. I'm, I can't remember. But he he was the bartender there and he basically said this was my way out. This was my way out of my small town. I have friends that say this same thing. The only way for me to get out of my small podunk town with, you know, very conservative beliefs, very traditional outlook, not a lot of opportunity. Um, okay. I just got a warning something about Odyssey, which I will try to fix. Uh, sorry about that, folks. If you're watching on Odyssey and yeah, I can't, uh, I can't figure out how to fix the problem. Uh, if you're watching on Odyssey and there's an issue with the stream, I apologize. It just told me that there's some kind of issue with the stream for Odyssey. But to go back to the point, we'll we'll, we'll sort that out later. Um, but to go back to the stream, to go back to the point that I was trying to make is when you're stuck in a in a very low income area like this person was, uh, as TJ was, and you want to get out and you want to you know move to a different place, uh, and you can't because poverty uh the military is your only way out you can't afford college because you know they're not going to give student loans to people that are in poverty because oh no they, they might not be able to pay it back later who knows we can't take that risk uh you know the financial institutions can't take that risk unless they're betting against you then they can take all the risk they want anyway so let's keep going so after deploying to the Persian Gulf in 2003 and experiencing unspeakable horrors, my military duty finally ended, and I took the best job available to me, working in the Norfolk Naval Shipyard in Portsmouth, Virginia, which I just mentioned, just talk about how I know a bunch of people uh, who are vets in, in Norfolk. Uh, the work was hazardous. I spent hours each day climbing around the tanks and voids on a submarine, that had to be certified safe to enter. There was always welding, grinding, sandblasting, and paint chipping going on. When I started coughing up black sludge, I knew I had to escape again. Poverty, I learned, is one long escape attempt after another. And boy, howdy, is that fucking true. Um, you know, when, when you are in poverty, all you're trying to do is escape out of it, and you finally do, and then something else comes up, because you're desperate, so you kind of take whatever comes your way, and and you know you 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 got to take whatever financial opportunities that roll around in your way. So, for this person, he had to take an incredibly dangerous job that probably didn't offer a lot of health benefits. Um, and once his health was compromised, it was okay, time to move to a different thing because this thing will literally kill me physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, and financially. Right. Like if he went to the doctor and he said, well, you have so and so disease and you have to be in the hospital for this much time. And he comes out and he gets, you know, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars in debt. Well, there goes your financial security and you're just stuck back in unending poverty again. So, yeah, so it is it is one escape after another. I've I've done it. I've taken on three, four jobs at a time trying to, like, just keep my head above water. And when that was, you know, too emotionally and physically taxing and I couldn't do what I was do, what I wanted to do. And it was affecting my relationships with with, you know, my family and 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 people that I was dating and my friends and all this other stuff. It was like, OK, I got to fucking I got to quit. And I got to find something different. I got to escape this, this, you know, cycle of poverty and, and go to a different cycle of poverty. But that, and that's how capitalism operates. So let's keep going. 
Uh, by then, I was married with children. I got myself into culinary school on a path to a better life. Then the Great Recession hit. As the economy collapsed around us, we often had to choose between paying bills and buying groceries. Boy, do I know that too. Um, you know, there were, there were many years uh, where that was a choice that I had to make. Many years um, eating just basic pasta and, you know, peanut butter sandwiches, um, you know, basic vegetables that I could find, nothing too crazy. And I, you know, I would, I, I would luck out every once in a while and find like a really good spice or something that I can start adding to my food, but really, really basic stuff. That's all I could afford, you know, and my mom would help me out here and there as well. She would, she would send me some food when I was, uh, stuck in this position. Um, so yeah, I've been there. It's like, okay, do I want to buy food or do I want to pay rent this month? I don't know. Let's let's see what happens. I guess rent is probably more important, you know, so I have been there. These years of trauma wrecked havoc on my mental health, as poverty and capitalism usually do. Uh, I got some cookie cutter drug based mental health treatment from the Veterans Associations, but that made things worse. At times, the VA treatment had had me in lockdown 24 seven. I was treated as a number, not as an individual pharmaceuticals. I that is not something that has worked for me. Therapy works for me. Time alone works for me. Um, I take different kinds of supplements. That works for me. Uh, taking a walk, doing exercises, writing, being creative, um, you know, uh, finding some sort of escapism through comic books or video games uh, has, has, been, has been far better than, uh, than pharmaceuticals for my mental health. Uh, that's not to say that pharmaceuticals don't work for you. They might, but everybody is different. But in this case, uh, this individual had negative effects to pharmaceuticals. And the job of the VA, if they treated him like he was a person, would see that and say, we got to take him off of the pharmaceuticals and maybe try some alternative therapies, uh, maybe try some different supplements. Um, but, you know, the VA is so underfunded and so overcrowded that they don't they might not have the, the resources to do that. So let's keep going. Uh, I'm sharing this because stories like mine are all too common, but we don't hear them very often, especially around the holidays like Fourth of July, which is true. Uh, more than three thirty thousand veterans have taken their own lives since 9-11 and over eight eight million Americans fell into poverty last year. Yet our country's continues to spend hundreds and billions of dollars each year on war and the Pentagon instead of building real paths out of poverty for people who grew up like I did. And again, that's very true because, uh, you know, um, we're about to spend a hundred billion dollars on a, on a better nuclear device that we don't need completely useless, completely unnecessary. Uh, Lee camp just did a whole story about that. Uh, he did a whole segment on Redacted Tonight about that. Uh, and, you know, instead, what do we need? We need health care. We need people to uh, get help, believe, you know, with debt relief, with rent relief. Um, we need a universal basic income in this country. We need better, you know, uh, an increase in the minimum wage in this country. We need so many more things then spending a hundred billion dollars that which all that money could very easily take care of all of the things I just mentioned. Uh, and instead we spend it on the military. We spend it on the Pentagon budget. We spend it on a new nuclear device we don't need. So, you know, it becomes pull yourself up by your bootstraps or join the military and maybe we'll help you out. So he goes on to say, corporations and the military industrial complex profit from our poverty. They get cheap labor and fatter profit margins. The rest of us deal with the interlocking effects of poverty, like poor health, trauma, poisonous living conditions, and all kinds of structural barriers uh, to opportunities. This is a political choice, and we can choose differently. And we can if we reallocate the budget that we have given to the Pentagon and the $100 billion we give to war profiteers uh, and merchants of death, and we utilize it to, to actually help people. That is something that we can absolutely do, and it is a lack of political will. It is the need to create enemies that don't particularly exist, that we've been doing since since forever, right? This McCarthyist, 
let's make an enemy out of somebody different so we can justify the only only thing that America is good at, which is creating weapons of destruction, creating weapons of death, instead of actually helping people. He talked about the backdoor draft. This is how the backdoor draft operates. Continue to oppress the people in your own country so their only way out of poverty is joining the military. And by the way, if they don't continue to stay in the military and become career military, then fuck them. Because that's how it works. The VA does not get the 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 funding that it deserves. But if you stay in the military, and and I and I, I address this in my video of uh, my my whole show about socialism, that's available on my channel. It's in the backlogs. Um, I recommend you guys go check that out. Uh, the biggest socialist secret in America is the military. If you stay in the military, the, if you become a career, career military person, you get health care. You get access to higher education for free. You get a really good retirement fund. You get great pension. Your housing is taken care of. All of that for serving capitalism. So there's a pocket of socialism that works, that works really, really well. But they don't really want to talk about it in that context. Because if they talk about it in that context and you look at it and you go, yeah, wait a minute, these people, you can afford it for these people. What if we, re you know, what if we reallocate the budget and, and do this for everybody? They would go, oh, well, then that's communism. And if you want communism, then you're going to have to give up all your freedoms because everything you do belongs to the government, which is a false way, which is, which is just false, just completely false. That's a whole bunch of propaganda nonsense. I know veterans that have waited for a decade or longer to get services within the VA. If you serve a rich person's war, shouldn't that rich person be thankful to you for doing their bidding, for putting your life on the line? But they don't, because when you come back home, how many homeless veterans are there in this country? The answer is too fucking many. Continuing on. For me, for me, things turned a corner when I found Veterans for Peace, a nonprofit organization for of veterans like me who understand that prioritizing federal spending on war and weapons over social program keeps people down. There we go. Veterans for Peace helped me connect with uh, connect to holistic treatment and supports uh, support that heals rather than harms. It also connected me to the bigger movement against poverty like Fight for 15, in which low-wage workers fight for our own economic empowerment by demanding fair wage. Finally, I found the Poor People's Campaign, which follows the steps of Martin Luther King Jr.'s efforts to end poverty in this country. Veterans for Peace became a sponsoring member of the Poor People's Campaign, making the connection between militarism and poverty. So again, something else that they won't talk to you about is the fact that Martin Luther King Jr. was actually pretty fucking socialist. And would actually want people like his his view on equality and civil rights actually comes from an anti-war socialist stance, because if you're anti-war, then you are anti-racist. That's how wars operate. They they dehumanize uh, the, the people by claiming that they're enemies. And and who does America claim are enemies? And in a lot of instances, it's black and brown people in black and brown countries. And and boy, fuck fuck all if they're socialists or communists if they're black socialists and black communists then holy fucking hell they'll do what what they did to fred hampton which is assassinate you but there's that connection between militarism and poverty it's a way out of poverty but only if you stick with it so if you're a conscientious objector if your conscience won't allow you to fight these wars and you want to get out, then you're going to be stuck right back into that into that 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 cycle of poverty again. And all the trauma and all the mental health and all of the detriment that you faced as a, a, a member of the military, they don't give a shit about. We believe that to truly fight poverty, we must slash the Pentagon budget. We can cut our annual military spending by at least $350 billion and still keep ourselves safe while building a more equitable society. And that's true. In order to keep the military running the way that it runs, 
you you need roughly three hundred billion dollars. Roughly. For me, the military wasn't a way out of poverty. Instead, militarism is why so many of us are poor in the first place. But if low-wage workers, veterans, and our workers together, uh, we can make the investments we need to choose human decency over war, trauma, and poverty. So there you go. It's a veteran coming out and saying that. Um, and, uh, and if you know veterans, you know that most of them are anti-war. Most veterans are anti-war. I think I've met two or three that said, um, I had one guy in, gosh, where the hell was I? Somewhere in Iowa. I'm trying to remember the name of the town. Maybe, I, I don't think it was Iowa City. It was somewhere in Iowa. And, um, you know, I met this vet. And, and we stood outside and talked for a few minutes. And I asked him, you know, do you still support war? And he goes, which one? And I said, just war in general. Like, do you, do you, do you support, you know? And he said, if it's against the right enemy. And I said, well, who's the right enemy? And he goes, well, there are terrorists out there that want to, you know, take our freedom. And I go, do you actually, do you really believe that even after you served? Like, after you, you, you saw, you know, what what wars are like you, you still believe that and he goes yeah if it's the right cause and i was like you, you know do you believe that this is the right cause and he goes hey i gotta fight terrorism somehow which you know yeah it's kind of crazy right but to him that was completely rational and justified um, I've had other people that's that said, yeah, we need war. That's the way that this country works. That's the way we keep our borders safe. If we have a smaller military, then we'll get invaded all the time, which I think is a very paranoid way to look at stuff. I, I, you know, these are veterans that, uh, that I've talked to, but most of the veterans that I've spoke uh, that I've talked to not pro war, very, very anti war, very, very anti war. Um, so, yeah. So let's look at your comments. Uh, Fred, good to see you. Good. Thank you for tuning in. Gene, nice to see you as well. Uh, Gene says, I'm there now, sitting here in this right-wing belly of the beast because it's it was this or homeless, and now it seems I can't escape. Uh, yeah, that's that's kind of the way that it is. I mean, I, I, I felt like I was going to be stuck in that position as well. Um, probably why I, I, I stayed in a pretty abusive uh, relationship for as long as I did was because I felt like, OK, where am I going to go? What am I going to do? How am I going to afford uh, my own place? Like we're working together and we're still kind of barely getting by, you know, and I and I didn't realize like, yeah, that's that's a trap in the cycle of poverty. Um, uh, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that you're stuck there, Gene. I, I hope that you get out of, uh, uh, of that situation soon. Uh, Gene also says these people seem to hate Biden, but they sure seem to love his shitty economic <laughs> EO. Uh, the next phase of cognitive, di uh, of cognitive dissonance that's unbelievably worse than the previous one. Yeah, the whole, well, you know, people don't think that democrats wage war but they forget about lyndon b johnson in vietnam they forget about uh what uh clinton did to eastern europe they forget that fdr was a democrat and got us into world war ii uh woodrow wilson was a democrat that got us into world war one and they go oh a different time blah blah and i mean they make these excuses this the, the, the cognitive dissonance is, is pretty, yes, like you said, it's pretty intense. It's pretty up there. Um, uh, Jaganatha, good to see you. Uh, it looks like Odyssey is doing okay. I am, I am like three or four minutes behind, or, or what it's showing up on my screen is three or four minutes behind, uh, you know, Hopefully, whatever the issue was has resolved itself. Uh, so, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. 
Okay. So I want to get into this. This is probably going to get me uh, quite a bit of hate uh, because we're going to talk about the Hindutva. Um, the Hindutva is uh, is a very far right faction of Hinduism in India right now, and and uh, there's a lot of Hindutva groups within the United States as well. Uh, a lot of Hindutva support supporters in the United States as well. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it, 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 basically there's, there's a, a whole lot of backlash that comes to anybody that criticizes the BJP, the RSS, what's going on in India now, the treatment of Muslims in India, the treatment of Muslims in Kashmir, the Indian occupation of Kashmir, the Hindutva kind of come out and they, and there's a lot of backlash against people that speak out. So, uh, by the way, if you are one of those people that wants to sit there and troll the post, please don't. Um, you know, I will block you if you're going to be a shitty troll. Um, you know, if you want to have a rational conversation about this and defend your side of the argument, if you are somebody that believes in the Hindutva, uh, great. But if you're just going to be a shitty troll, you're going to get blocked. Um, uh, because I have no tolerance for that. I have enough shit that I'm dealing with that I don't fucking need Hindutva trolls. Uh, so I let, let's look at this. So there, there, there is. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll talk about this a little bit more uh, shortly. Uh, but I want to read this definition from the Hindutva Harassment Field Manual, uh, which is put together by the South Asian Scholar Activist Collective. Uh, and by the way, th th this story was sent to me uh, by my friend Aiden. Uh, so shout out to him. Thank you for 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 sending this over. Very, very informative article that led me to a lot of really great stuff. Um, so Hindutva, literally Hinduness, is a modern political ideology that advocates for Hindu supremacy and seeks to transform India, a secular state, into an ethno-religious nation known as the Hindu Hin Hindu Rashtra, Hindu nation. Hindutva is the official platform of the BJP, an extreme right political party in India. Parts of the Indian diaspora, including the United States, as uh, also champion Hindutva. Some scholars define Hindutva as a type of Hindu nationalism, whereas uh, others use Hindutva and Hindu nationalism as synonyms. Hindutva ideology is promoted by an array of vigilante political and cultural groups known as the Sangh Parivar. Uh, the RSS, a paramilitary organization based in India, is at the center of the Sangh and sets the priorities and tactics for promoting Hindutva ideology. The RSS, RSS's <laughs> overseas branch, the HSS, actively operates to promote Hindu nationalist ideas and goals among the Hindu diaspora, including in the United States. Hindutva ideology dates back roughly 100 years. Its early ide ideologues were informed by ethno-nationalist movements in the 20th in the early 20th year uh, in the early 20th century Europe including Italy and Germany. Leading scholars on Hindutva consider the ideology uh, to have remained stable over the last century especially in its core objective a Hindu rashtra where some Indians will be more equal than others. So there we go. There's the start to this. Uh, lots of problems within within that definition, right? W or or what, what, what this collective is defining Hindutva to be and what I've seen Hindutva to be, which is Hindu nationalism. And again, any form of nationalism will lead into inequality. Uh, what they are de describing is not a, a, a democratic process at all. Uh, and, and I would go as far as to say that any culture, any society, in any country that has um, classism uh, it, it, at its core, which America does, which uh, India does, the UK does, all of these it cannot be a democracy. If there are different classes of people and one class is valued higher than the other, you cannot claim that that is a democracy. You cannot when one person is more equal than another, that is not equality. That is by definition not equality. So, again, a Hindu Rashtra where some Indians are will be more equal than others is not a democracy. 
India cannot claim that it is go- it is going to move forward with a Hindutva ideology and claim that it's a democracy. It's the same thing here. Republicans sit here and preach that America needs to be a Christian nation with Christian ideals. No, it's a secular nation. It's always been that way. That's how the fucking country got started. And if you're going to claim that it's a Christian nation, meaning giving more preference to 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 Christians than any other uh, sex in your country, you cannot claim that you're a democracy. Now, there's various other reasons why America is not a democracy, primarily the fact that we are a country that is uh, run by capitalism, owned by rich people, and, the, and they are the ones that make our rules and laws and let and control politicians. We're an oligarchy. That's the that's the truth behind it. Um, but India can't claim that either by wanting to be a Hindutva nation. They just can't. So what is the problem with this, right? Uh, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention too is this is also similar to how Zionists and Israel look at Israel. Certain people are going to be valued more than other people and they want the complete extermination of Palestinians so that there is no fucking Arab influence within their country. That's how Zionists look. And Zionists didn't give a shit too, by the way. It, uh, I, I released a video just this week on Monday talking about uh, talking about BDS and talking about how Zionists in the early 1900s, around the same time that the Hindutva was being formed, were looking at Africa, specifically Kenya and Uganda, as areas where they could set up the Jewish homeland. To them, it didn't it didn't fucking matter where it was. It didn't matter where it was. It just so happened to be that that you know they they went to Palestine, and there's a lot more involved in terms of land grabs and and displacement because of the British. But they were in talks with the British of just taking over Ken, parts of Kenya and Uganda and making that making that Israel basically. It didn't fucking matter. And they would have done the same thing in Kenya and Uganda as they're doing in Palestine. So again, you can look at the parallels of how Hindutva and Zionism work very closely, very similarly. Their philosophies are very much in line. Creating these ethno-national theocracies. That's what they are. Their ethno national theocracy. They want to sit there and claim that Israel is the only fucking democracy in the Middle East. That's a lie. It's a bold faced fucking lie. They are an ethno national fucking theocracy. And that's what India wants to become too. That's what India is on the track of becoming. And if you criticize this, instead of trying to have a rational debate, they'll fucking attack you, they'll attack you for it. That's what they do. They harass you for it. So that's why the South Asian Scholar Activist Collective created this uh, Hindutva harassment uh, uh, field manual so that people can learn about what this philosophy is, learn how they attack, and how to counter it. There's a lot of great uh, information on the site. I want to look through... um, I want to look through about two, two, three of them uh, you know, some of them are shorter than others, uh, but it kind of helps you understand a little bit more about what this philosophy is doing to people that criticize it. And and again, capitalism operates the same way. Anytime you cr- criticize capitalists, uh, the fucking trolls come out, right? And I find it hilarious, hilarious that these people are the first ones that come out and, and make fun of snowflakes for, you know, not liking racist jokes or misogynist jokes or the low hanging fruit bullshit jokes that reinforce negative stereotypes that don't exist in our society anymore. And they go, oh, fucking, you're such a snowflake. Oh, you're trying to censor speech. What next? What next? What can we say next? What words are you going to say? And then the second you criticize capitalism, they go, fucking, you can't say shit like that. And you can't do shit. And Hindutva operates the same way. You can't say shit like that. You can't, you know, all of a sudden they get real sensitive. All of a sudden these champions of free speech are trying to fucking lock up speech. Okay, so I want to look at look at a couple of these sections here. So this is uh 
Intersectionality in Hindutva. Critics of Hindutva are often attacked on the basis of their presumed caste and religious affiliation. Dalit voices, uh, lower class, Dalit voices as well as individuals from non-Hindu faiths and atheists are automatically maligned wrongly as bigoted uh, by pro-Hindutva individuals. Hindutva advocates attempt to silence critical Hindu voices who are upper caste by claiming the individual is self-hating or self or, or, or misinformed. Uh, again, the Israel lobby does this. I mean, the Israel lobby got the Justice Department to 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 redefine um, anti-Semitism. It's no longer a hatred of Jewish people. Uh, it's 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 people that criticize, demonize, or delegitimize Israel, uh, which would mean, under by that definition, Hitler wasn't really an anti-Semite because Israel wasn't a thing when Hitler was around. And if that's the definition we're going by, then I guess you can't call Hitler an anti-Semite. The Justice Department doesn't consider Hitler to be an anti-Semite. Israel doesn't consider is uh, Hitler to be an anti-Semite. This is the same way. If you're critical of the Hindutva, it doesn't mean that you are critical of Hinduism as a whole. Because this is a faction of it. This is a, a very extreme faction of Hinduism. Um, and, and then they claim that, oh, you're self-hating, right? Which is, again, something that I've seen the Zionists do as well. Of, of uh, you know, like the Jews for Palestine groups. They're just self-hating. They're misinformed. They don't understand the problem. They're coming from a point of privilege, really for advocating for people that don't have a formalized military are living in rubble and have uh, uh and and as israel put it have put these people on a on a diet in an open air prison with limited internet and limited electricity those people defending those people is coming from a point of privilege so we continue however to better appreciate how one experiences being a target of Hindutva harassment, we must recognize that one's religious and caste background is not attacked in isolation. Targets of Hindutva harassment come from different class positions, maybe gender non-conforming and LGBTQ plus identifying. Also, not all critics of Hindutva are South Asians. Individuals of different races, ethnicities, nationalities are critical of Hindutva. The harassment and hate they face for voicing opposition impacts them in multiple and intersectional ways. For example, frequently when individuals are targeted, the attack is also gendered and sexualized. And it, an individual's appearance may be belittled and they may receive threats ranging from sexual harassment to assault, de uh, designated to intimidate and silence their criticism. Again, very similar. Uh, th this is somewhat similar to how the Israel lobby operates. The Israel lobby gets a little bit more, uh, and, and the Hindutva does this too. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but, you know, it's it's attacking college-aged women, right? That they that they seem, that they that they claim are, 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 are defenseless, right? The, kind of using like the damsel in distress kind of thing. Uh, and then they, and then they attack them. Um, and they make fun of their appearance. That's how you know that you've won the argument, by the way, is when they don't have anything to debate you on an intellectual level or to counter you on an intellectual level. And they make fun of the way you look or they make fun of or, or they say some kind of racist thing. Right. That's that's how I know I've won the debate. I always start with. I like to open a debate by by a you look like joke. You know, just open that up. We'll start low. That's that's like low hanging fruit, and then we'll work our way to the intellectual debate. That's what I like to do. I don't go down the racist or sexist route, but a, you look like a John Goodman from uh, the Big Lebowski. Now we can move forward with the debate. Now that we've addressed that, we've done the low hanging fruit thing. But that's how you know you've won, though, is when they don't have like anything to debate you on an intellectual level with with facts or any sort of philosophical argument or anything like that. And they just go like, well, you look like a clown. 
Okay. I think I won. So, uh, so this is uh, uh, mushing my words. This is about Hindutva outside, um, outside India, right? South Asia is not a monolith. Not all South Asians are from India, and not all are Hindu. I, for one, grew up Hindu. I'm an agnostic now. Uh, South Asians are from other nations in the region or live outside the region in the diaspora. I would be considered the diaspora. Living outside South Asia may be used to discredit critics either by arguing the individual uh, lacks on on the ground knowledge or has been corrupted by Western perspectives of South Asian history, religion, and culture. Also, individuals of South Asian descent born outside the region may be dismissed as lost children of the diaspora who possess no authentic information about Hinduism, South Asian history, and or politics. Uh, so here's the dip with that. It, it, it can't work with me because I was born there. I lived there for eight years. I'm well aware of how things operate there. I still have family there that I keep in touch with. My family, a lot of my family is still traditional Hindu. So I know how that how the religion and the philosophy operates. I have practiced Hinduism for the better part uh, for about half my life. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm 32. I'm 32 now. I was uh, I was a practicing Hindu till I was about 15 years old. So that's a little little under half my life. I was a practicing Hindu. I know what those philosophies uh, stand for. I know what those prayer rituals do. I know what they are for. So when they attack me, there's there you know they can claim that I'm the lost diaspora, but no, not really. I lived and experienced this shit. I saw how my sister was treated by the traditionalist conservative members of my family, and I did not fucking care for it. And neither did my sister. And trust me, my sister is somebody that doesn't need my fucking defense as as the male in the family to come to, to her to her aid. She will fucking hold her own. And she has. But again, that goes against what the Hindutva want. They'll 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 levy the attacks of, well, you don't know any better. You don't live there. You're not in you're not in the know. You can't be you know, it's like, no, but we are in the know because we're still steeped in that culture that still surrounds our family. To continue, the diversity within the South Asian diaspora globally further complicates how the Hindutva man hate, hate manifests. Many members of the Indian diaspora were or are hyper selected to immigrate to North America, Europe, and other places for their skill, which results in a in the majority of these diasporic communities being the uh, Savarna, the upper class. South Asian diasporic spaces uh, and politics are frequently defined by the upper class individuals, uh, including the prejudices uh, prejudices held by some members of this group. Uh, Dalit and non-Hindu South Asian diasporic individuals are often unwelcome in these spaces, continuing the discrimination and hate they experience in South Asia through Hindutva, casteism, and other forms of biases in their new homes, both uh, social and professional spaces. Uh, such discrimination and hate is hard to expose to the larger public of their new homes who are unfamiliar with the history and diversity of the region. Hindutva outside India takes advantage of this ignorance to inappropriately adopt the language of diversity and inclusion to promote their narrow views to attack their critics. These tactics, uh, uh, these tactics can result in retaliation that include the critic losing their employment, and potentially being deported if a critic's immigration status is linked to their employment. Uh, so again, this is something that the Israel lobby does as well. They go after kids, college kids, and make sure that they can't uh, get a job based on their based on their views. Oh, you have these extremist views. They seem to be a little ridiculous. Uh oh, you're getting a little too political. Can't have that. We're going to pass on your application. So it's very insidious the way that they do that. The discrimination that they're talking about, um, you know, the uh, it, it's interesting because when Indian people find me, because I bill myself as an Indian comedian, I'm not lying about that. Um, you know, when they find me and they come to the show, they get uh, pretty upset and annoyed because I am not... They prefer because they look at me as a stand-up comic. They look at me as someone of of a lower of a, of a lower cast. Um, 
And usually, th this is what I've experienced, is usually when, when the rich Indian people find my show, they don't like it. And they feel like I'm being unfairly critical of India and unfairly critical of America. Because I'm, I'm criticizing the way that they made their wealth. Um, now, here's the other thing, too, right? When I criticize the Hindutva, I have looked into the BJP and the RSS. And I've looked into Modi. And for a little while, I was, I was trying to defend him and, and say, well, you know, his policies are stating this, that, and the third. It seems like they're not executed properly. Where I think they were executed, where, where now, after kind of looking into the history of this a little bit more, learning a little bit more about his past and the way his policies have evolved, you know, Modi is the uh, uh, current leader of the extreme right-wing party in, in India. And usually when you go extreme right-wing, you lean right into fascism. You leave, lean right into, uh, into authoritarianism. And now being connected with a Hindu nationalist party, it becomes more and more evident of that, right? I, I did give him a fair shake and give him a, a, the benefit of the doubt to say, okay, let's see what he can do. He's talking about implementing, okay, you know, he implemented privatized health care. It didn't work out. He pulled back from it and tried to implement some kind of socialized health care. Uh, which you don't see right-wing leaders doing. He wanted to get everybody digital literacy. He wanted to prevent corruption. What did he do? He took a, a primarily cash-based society and he took out two of the big big bills out of circulation, didn't give pe enough people enough time to try to go get bank accounts. You know, people that lived in the villages, people that lived far away, migrant workers couldn't, couldn't access their money. And a lot of people just lost more income. Thus, pushing people into poverty. Now, that was badly executed, but he never rectified his actions. So, and now, if you look at the way that Muslims are treated in India, if you look at the way that agnostics and atheists and skeptics are treated in India, if you look at the way India is treating Kashmir, it becomes very, very evident that this is leaning right in, like they are leaning hard into a right-wing theocracy. Uh, I want to move to a different section. I would highly encourage you guys to go look at that website. Uh, Hindutva Harassment Field Manual dot org is uh, is what it's called. Um, I want to look at this section here. So this is Hindutva attacks on academics. Uh, while some academics may choose to respond by making their social media accounts private, others who choose to use platforms to share their research and views are vulnerable to a typical form of swarming online behavior and the subsequent harassment that may follow offline. When an online coordinated swarm goes after an academic, it can create the appearance of widespread discontent against the academic, even if no such discontent actually exists among the students or colleagues of the academics in question. I believe this happened to Brett Weinstein. This this sounds like a very similar situation to Brett Weinstein. Um, I, I, I would love to go into way more details of that, but that was uh, Washington, the state of Washington. Um, I believe uh, Brett Weinstein is a lefty intellectual. Uh, bear in mind that many of these accounts are likely fake and not associated with a real person. So this happens a lot. This happens a lot. I when I did when I posted my videos about Kashmir, um, you know, I got attacked by Twitter trolls, uh, and I muted uh, uh, most of them. But you know, their accounts were created like May 2021 or October 2020. And the only thing that they are retweeting and the only thing that they're saying is things from the BJP, things from the RSS, you know, they're, they're quote, they're, 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 uh, you know, adding fucking people like Amit Shah. Same thing happened with my Palestine videos. People would, th there were certain accounts that would come out, you know, they, they were just made two months ago. They have very few followers. They follow very few people, but, but they're bots. They're not real accounts. Or their paid accounts to to look you know look up people with particular hashtags or particular keywords and to go lambaste them. They're paid to do that. That's 
that actually does exist. Um, so the, these guys aren't, you know, they're they're not saying anything, uh, uh, you know, ridiculous here. And here we go. They're created solely to amplify Hindutva messaging and create the impression of mass outrage. Such bots can and should be reported to the platform in question, but increasingly sophisticated methods, uh, including the use of cyborgs, uh, can make it difficult to identify and remove bots from platforms. To learn more about bots, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the Atlantic Council Digital Forensics Research Lab. The Atlantic Council is part of NATO, uh, and, uh, and they kind of control what happens on Facebook. So I wouldn't be surprised if this gets shadow banned on Facebook. Um, moreover, the weaponized use of trending hashtags, particularly those um, that name the target, should be treated with due caution instead of being uncritically accepted as the index of a, quote, real disc uh, discontent caused by the academic in question. It is sometimes possible to stop the swarm by blocking the prominent Hindutva accounts that either respond to or share one's content. Nonetheless, these coordinated attacks may well uh, continue beyond the control of an individual user. Moreover, Hindutva harassers take advantage of public, uh, pub publicly available information, including information on university websites, about the academic academics courses, office locations, and office phone numbers to continue these attacks offline. This can create security concerns for both faculty and students, as well as their families on and off campus. So that's like doxing, what they're talking about, that you can get doxed by these people. Um, so this is the last section to, to read here, addressing manufactured complaints. Ah. Get it to stay right. Coordinated attacks can range from simply posting a disagreeable tweet on a big group, asking people to criticize the academic, to actively send mass emails to the university, accusing them of Hindu phobia. Again, if you criticize Hindutva, if you criticize the BJP, if you criticize what India is doing, you you're you're claimed a Hindu phobe, Hindu phobic, right? You created a Hindu phobe, um, and uh, and that's just not true. This is not actual Hinduism. This is creating a, 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 a Hindu nationalist ethno state is, is not what Hinduism stands for. Nowhere, nowhere in the tenets of Hinduism does it say that we need a Hindu Hindu centric state. Nowhere in, in, in Judaism does it say that we they, they need a, 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 a Jewish central ethno state. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that about Christians. Any religious belief that says that is not representative of the actual religious belief. Um, given the scope and scale of the activities of the BJP IT cell and those modeled on it uh, in the diaspora, it is easy to create the impression that an academic at your in university is Hindu phobic. Uh, da -da 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 -da, uh, so basically, I go on to say that it's in bad faith term to increasingly propagated by. Uh, the online BJP IT cell and its sympathizers to curtail dissent or critique, whether in India or abroad. In particular, accusations of Hindu are, are are used to silence criticism of casteism, uh, or sorry, casteism, or Brahminical patriarchy. Online glossaries produced in efforts to promote the term Hindu phobia by Hindu organizations, for example, cite Brahmanism, an accepted term within social scientific academic research and anti-caste Dalit intellectual traditions as a colonial term that reveals the Hindu phobia of the speaker. Um, th that gets a little complicated, right? Um, basically, they're claiming that if you if you criticize, especially if you criticize like casteism and Brahminical patriarchy, which is basically if you're a Brahmin, then the woman doesn't have a whole lot of say in what happens. And that traditional Hindu viewpoint that I don't particularly like or agree with or anything like that. Uh, you know, you're 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 uh being Hindu phobic in colonial terms, right? They're basically saying, well, you're 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 using the language of the colonizers that kept the Brahmins down. That 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 didn't let the Brahmins reach the the highest level of the caste that uh, they could have, which is simply not true. In fact, um, the colonizer England is the reason why there is a religious divide 
why why religion is used as a political divider. Uh, so Hindutva, in the way that Hindutva operates, is actually going along the lines of the colonizers, along the lines of what the British colonizers wanted for India. They wanted India to be a Hindu-centric ethnostate. They wanted Pakistan to be an Islamic-centered ethnostate. Divide the two religions, sow some chaos, take Kashmir. Reap the benefits of its resources. Well, we can't stay in India or Pakistan for too long because they're kicking us out. What if we fuck things up a little bit? So really, Hindutva is going along the lines of what the colonizers want. I'm going to go uh, to the bottom here. The kinds of attacks that academics may also uh, may face may also cause serious distress as Hindutva activists regularly use casteist, Islamophobic, anti-Christian, misogynistic, homophobic, anti-Semitic, xenophobic, anti-black, and ableist language against their targets. Given the psychological toll of such attacks, uh, offer the target mental health resources to cope with the stress of the situation. Consider addressing pub publicly the harm such language uh, to the to the wider university community disavowing such hate speech explicitly. So again, you know, the AstroTurf Israel lobby protesters that I, I, I did a whole video about that, again, released that earlier this week, they use these really horrific terms. And and it and it does become racist and sexist, and it does become anti homophobic and xenophobic. It does become anti black. These viewpoints are racist and discriminatory and sexist. That's what they're 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 built out of that. They're built out of that. So th those are the weapons that they use. So if you're going to support them, then that's really what you're fucking leaning towards you're leaning towards this this notion of zionism is anti-black they wanted to fucking colonize africa they also treat black jews like trash in israel they also didn't allow um a, a orthodox group of ugandan jews to come into israel they're not allowed indians have the same thing the the, the hyper conservative hindutvas have the same thing. They don't look at women in a in a positive light. Very homophobic, anti-Christian, you know, because that's a monotheistic religion and they believe that it all has to be polytheistic or else you're wrong. Now, I, I mean, I've pointed out the parallels throughout this whole thing between Zionists and the Hindutva and if this is the direction India is going to go, then India is going to become Israel in five years. Uh, meaning that they are going to be an apartheid state. I, there, I mean, there's, there's virtually no argument against that. If you look at the direction of all these things, based on the way that I've laid things out, India is on track to become the next apartheid state. Kashmir is, is on track to become the next Palestine. I wouldn't be surprised if this goes to the next step, right? That there are Hindutva tank, uh, Hindutva think tanks, um, and and a, a Hindu lobby in India. I wouldn't be surprised if again we see legislation veering towards saying anything critical about India, anything cr critical about Hinduism or the, or the Hindutva is Hindu phobic and is considered hate speech. But the hate speech that they levy against all these other groups is totally fine. I would not be surprised if that's the direction things go. So keep your eyes out for that. Push back against that kind of shit when you see it. Uh... Gene over on the Rockfin says, uh, speaking of cognitive dissonance, dissonance, it's impossible to 
have democracy in any hierarchy, yet people still believe we can live in a democracy because politicians say we do. Uh, yes, I find that incredibly hilarious. Um, you know, people say, uh, oh, yeah, we're, we have a democracy, but we need that hierarchy. It's it's always the capitalist that always talks about uh, democracy and equality and inclusion, but they live in a hierarchy where literally one group of people is worth less than another group of people. That's what capitalism is. And that's why under capitalism, you can't actually have a democracy. That's why under capitalism, it'll always veer towards fascism. It'll always veer towards authoritarianism, military or otherwise. And we're heading towards that in America, too. This is not just a, a problem for India. It's a problem for everywhere, especially when you when capitalism is, is the root of all of this stuff. I got uh, I got uh, I'll tell you guys this real quick before we wrap things up here is. Um, I got kicked out of a, a BIPOC group, uh, which is a black indigenous people of color group that was run by an Indian woman. Um, and I'd connected with them and, and they came out to see me, uh, perform live. She, she came with a group of, uh, you know, four or five people. It was very nice. She came and said, hello, very nice person. Uh, but I, you know, talk about the farmer strike in India. I've, I've talked a lot about the farmer strike in India. And uh, somebody called me out and said that I was a, uh, a communist propagandist because what it seemed like is a group of uh, communist extremists had co-opted this farmer strike, uh, which, you know, I didn't fully understand because I was too communist and, you know, I was spreading misinformation. I was talking about the largest general strike in human history. 250 million people in India went on strike. Uh, and, you know, what they, they were standing in solidarity with the farmers, which is a huge, huge job market for, in India. And the farmers were going against neoliberal economic policies that were going to crush the farming industry in India. So they call me a propagandist. I corrected them in the comment section saying, hey, I'm not a propagandist. You know, this is what's going on. I, I articulate that in the video. Um, you know, if you want more resources, I'm happy to give it to you. Day or two later, I'm banned from that group. I'm kicked out. Can't rejoin it. Can't do anything. Because I was critical of the BJP. I was critical of capitalism. I was critical of the right-wing theocratic party in India. And that somehow makes me less Indian in the eyes of these people. This, part, this, this group that believes in inclusivity is aligning itself with, with these beliefs that are discriminatory in every way. Which was just, which was just really, really disappointing to to see. To be honest, um, you know, I wasn't given a reason, I wasn't given a heads up or a warning or anything like that. Just kind of kicked out. Uh, and, and yeah, you know, it, it it was it was disheartening to see that kind of stuff. But that's what happens. And what I mean, they point out a really good thing is like when you do get attacked by trolls and they and they use discriminatory language, it affects your mental health and it affects it pretty negatively to deal with that sort of stuff all the time. I, you know, if I see a troll online attacking a per, uh, attacking somebody that I follow and and I believe in, if I if I see it and there's nobody else defending this person, I will try to defend them. I will try to kind of push the trolls away. It's hard. It's taxing. It takes up a lot of your time. But people don't need to go through. The, the thing that happens is you feel very alone. You feel like there's nobody on your side. And that's the point of the trolls is to isolate you. And part of the problem with these social media platforms is once the trolls start attacking, this is, I mean, I felt like the, the near tandem trolls fucking attacked me. 
And, you know, I, I brought that up once or twice. The, the people that normally follow me didn't even fucking see my tweet. A handful of them did. I, I got a couple of likes here and there. Uh, but they barely saw the tweet. So they barely saw the responses that were coming out. But that's how they operate. Twitter, Facebook, all that stuff, especially if they're like siding with the Atlantic Council. They side with these organizations. They side with the Israel lobby and they'll side with the Hindutva lobby when the Hindutva lobby shows up. So when you are critical of them and they and, and trolls come out and attack you, they don't silence the trolls. And neither do they show your posts to the people that would follow you or are following you. So even the social media platforms are really against you. So, so really, it falls on us to counter that harassment by going and, and you know, saying, hey, you're very wrong. Your attacks are pretty racist. That has nothing to do with the argument that's being said here. And hopefully the, the poster or whoever blocks them. I, I mean, at the end of the day, that's really all you can do is to block these accounts. So, yeah, all right. We are going to wrap things up here. Uh, thank you guys for hanging out. If you guys enjoyed this content, you guys know the drill. Make sure you hit the like button. Make sure you share this out with as many people as possible because this is, uh, this is the type of stuff you're not going to see on corporate mainstream media. You just won't. You just won't see it there. Uh, so I, I encourage you guys to hit the like and the share button. And please make sure you're subscribed, whether it's on Odyssey, Rockfin, Facebook, uh, especially if you're on YouTube. And especially if you're listening to the audio version of this, please make sure you subscribe um, and, you know, leave a comment, uh, leave a review. If you're listening to this on uh, on the audio version, those those help those help uh, get, you know, more people get to see them and stuff. Uh, if you are on stable financial ground and would like to make a donation, you can do so over at krishmohanhaha.com slash donate, become a sustaining member, get a bunch of free stuff, including free tickets including free tickets to virtual shows and live shows when I come through your city. And if you want to find out about live shows, you can subscribe to my free email list that goes out once a week. I'll be putting up dates, ticket links, um, and, uh, and a bunch of cool stuff on there. It goes out every Sunday. And if you miss a stream, if you miss a video, if you miss a podcast that I've released, uh, then um, you know the, the email list kind of gives you a list of all of that stuff. All of that stuff. So, so that's the best way to do it. Uh, and I do have live shows coming up, which I'm very ex excited about. I should have tickets for a bunch of these up by next week. So I'll be able to like tell you guys dates and locations and where to go to get tickets. But right now, the details are on my website, krishmohanhaha.com, K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. Uh, I've got live shows scheduled in Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Baltimore, Lansing, Detroit, Little Rock. I just added Louisville. I'm looking to add Minneapolis. I'm looking to add Chicago, Bloomington, Illinois, uh, Des Moines, Iowa, Cincinnati, Columbus, Ohio, uh, possibly Indianapolis, St. Louis, uh, Huntsville, Memphis, Charlotte, Greensboro, Greenville, Norfolk, tons of places I'm trying to get back to. Uh, so uh, if you're in any of these cities, be patient. I am working on coming down to your city to perform live stand-up comedy. Uh, but speaking of that, I'm actually going to go write tonight, uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to exercise and write, take care of my, take care of the mind and body a little bit. Uh, been really, really stressful, uh, dealing with a lot of this crazy shit. So, um, and, uh, I really appreciate you guys' support. I really appreciate you guys tuning in, hanging out, um, and, uh, uh, and, and leaving, leaving some comments and thank you for the tip. Gene, Gene left a tip. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, Gene, Fred, Zozovix, uh, over on the Odyssey, we have Test 2 and Jaganatha, uh, the folks over on Facebook, Aiden, thank you very much for, for tuning in, leaving comments. Um, I, I've got some podcasts coming out this weekend. I, I just released the Ifat Ghazia interview, uh, speaking of Hindutva, she, she has great information about Kashmir. You guys should go check that out when you get, get a chance. Um, that's, that's out on Rockfin already. And I think the podcast just went up. Um, and then I'll have another one tomorrow talking about the custom and border protection agency. Uh, so stay tuned for those, but we'll be back next week with some live streams. Uh, Tuesday, I'll probably do either a early live stream or a very late live stream. I will tweet that out 
because at 5 p.m. Eastern, I'm going to be joining Graham Elwood. Uh, we're going to be talking about what's going on with my car. Um, and I'm just going to kind of get that information out there uh, so that people are in the know. And, and you know, if this is happening to you, to, to know that you're not alone and maybe, you know, we can band together and, 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 and get people treated fairly, uh, especially during the pandemic. So uh, Tuesday, I will be on, on Graham Elwood's program. Uh, at 5 p.m. Eastern. So stay tuned for that. But uh, anyway, you guys have a great weekend. Take care of yourselves and we'll see you on the road.